Marshawn Sager here. Welcome back to The Realignment. Hey guys, welcome back to the show. Sagar and I are excited to return with our weekly discussion episodes now that we are off our summer hiatus. This episode is really broad. It's in response to a supercast listener question that typically would have been locked and for subscribers only. We decided to open it up because the question deals directly with the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, a fitting topic because we are going into the 21st anniversary of the 20, of the 9-11 attacks and, of course, the one-year anniversary of the fall of Kabul and the U.S. final withdrawal from Afghanistan. If you'd like to get access to more questions, submit your own, get the rest of our bonus content, and help shape the further direction of our show, go to realignment.supercast.com. Once again, that's realignment.supercast.com. There's going to be a bunch of different books and ideas referenced in this show. So I'm putting together a special bookshop storefront that will list all the books that we're going to mention, different ideas you want to get more into this topic. You could click the link in the show notes on your podcast player or in the YouTube section. I'm also going to put out a sub stack that really brings us all together tomorrow on Friday. So you should also go click that link to subscribe there as well. That is a free product, unlike the Supercast. All the links, everything's really necessary there. And hope you all enjoy this conversation. So this question directly relates to a topic I was going to bring up today, which is 9-11. We're obviously going into the 21st anniversary, it would always be the anniversary of Biden's pullout from the country, which depending on your perspective was either a disaster or the right thing to do given the cost. So here's the question and Sagar, it's directed to me, but I want you to answer first. Foreign policy disasters. Marshall commented in an episode that the invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq were the single worst foreign policy decisions in the history of the country. Well, I don't disagree. I think there's a strong case to be made for America's part in the Vietnam War. Clearly, both were disasters with many similarities, and we have more distance from the Vietnam War. Can we make the case for why Afghanistan and Iraq will be worse for the U.S. in the long term? Love the show. I want to clarify one thing. I definitely meant that the war in Iraq was the most disastrous foreign policy decision in U.S. history. The actual war in Afghanistan, which I will define, and Sagar, I think you'll agree with this, as, hey, it's 9-12. The Taliban are giving uh, safe haven to Osama bin Laden. They're not handing them over we're going to invade and remove Al-Qaeda's capacity to wage further attacks in the United States. That is a good decision. I think that was the right decision. This debate gets more complicated once we get into December 2001, after he's escaped. 2006, after the Afghans have had elections. But I just want to give that clarity there. But Sagar, like, just respond to the question, then we'll get into it a bit. Yeah, uh, that actually, that's a frame I personally got from Gene Edward Smith. I think it's a book, it might be covered up behind me, called W by Gene Edward Smith. Fantastic book. RIP, by the way, he just died. Yeah, he's, um, a, he's a bunch of good biographies if people want to check those oh, out. Oh, I've got at least three of them behind me. He did one on Grant. He did one on FDR. Also, he was Canadian, which I find odd. Uh, Eisenhower. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> Eisenhower. Yeah. Great ones. Yeah. Anyway, so great American presidential historian from Canada. So shout out to him. He wrote a line in W, which I believe was his last work. And he mm -hmm. said that Iraq is a single worst foreign policy decision of American history. And I, I, I thought this exact same thing. I was like, what about Vietnam? What about? And here was his uh, here was his response. I actually got to talk to him on the phone once. Um, oh, really? Yeah. Back in like 2016, I forget exactly. I think I was interviewing him for a piece or something. I asked him specifically about this quote. And he goes, look, here's a difference between Iraq and Vietnam. Iraq was a conscious, conjured up choice. Afghanistan and Vietnam were slow rolling disasters of which there were multiple bad choices made that made it into a multifaceted crisis. Iraq was a choice that we made specifically to positively invade the country. Now, let's talk the timeline of Vietnam, because it's actually important. Most people actually don't even know this. Okay, so, uh, well, I guess, uh, how far back do we See, go? Uh, I was gonna say, yeah. you, you should really start in 1949 okay. I was say, when let's start. China falls. There we go, China falls. Now we have Vietnam. Uh, France coming off the heels of the horrific embarrassment of World War II, Charles de Gaulle, uh, comes into power in the 1950s. He wants to solidify power in the former French Empire in Algeria and French Indochina. So he decides Indochina, which is currently known as Vietnam, should not fall to the growing communist influence North Vietnamese army Ho Chi Minh. Here's what happens. The French then begin their counterinsurgency campaign in the north, which culminates, and you might have to fact check me on this. I don't know the year. When was Dien Bien Phu? It was during the Eisenhower 1954. 
Okay, so early uh, 1950, for first half of the decade of the 1950s is really marks the beginning of American involvement in Vietnam, where the French get involved in this horrific battle known as Dien Bien Phu, becomes a siege, the French uh, die, they basically lose to the North Vietnamese, but it actually gets presented to Eisenhower as this is a chance for the United States to stand up as a uh, part of the post-Cold War uh, battle of communism they actually presented him an option to use nuclear weapons in Dien Bien Phu. And uh, for those who are interested in the nuclear taboo that evolved over 25 years and really culminated in the Cuban Missile Crisis, that was a pivotal moment for U.S. policymakers because at that time there were all these interesting debates in U.S. strategic discourse about the tactical use of nuclear weapons, quote unquote tactical nukes. They were like, nukes are here, we should use them, smaller nukes are fine, um, but Eisenhower intuited, they're like, no, there's something actually very, very different about a nuclear weapon uh, as opposed to uh, uh, conventional war conflict. And Eisenhower, uh, by pushing aside British and French ambitions, both in the Suez Canal and not coming to French defense in Indochina, affirmatively declares like the United States is not going to get involved in these imperialist projects. Instead, they also rejecting the Korean War policy of Harry Truman, are going to focus on core national defense and not go in search of these foreign interventions. This is complicated because there's a lot of CIA stuff going on at the time too. Let's put that aside. All right, so then what happens is the John F. Kennedy comes in the 1960s. He, of course, runs on the could missile I cut in, Yeah, go could ahead. I cut in, could I get cut in real quick? Because yes. this gets to, just add to the 1950s part. So the key thing, and this is why we're saying the initial Vietnam thing is not a purposeful, disastrous decision. It's answering a complicated world in different ways. When I referenced 1949 in China, the huge U.S. foreign policy debate in 1949 that then shaped yeah, our response to China. the Korean War is who lost China. You obviously have Chiang Kai-shek, who was the nationalist Chinese leader during World War II. At that point, China is completely um, nationalist. Mao Zedong and the communists actually just win the war in 1949. It's a total surprise to the U.S. Mm -hmm. and the West. Chiang Kai-shek and his forces then flee to Taiwan, which leads us into a whole other topic of why we are where we are today. China is not recognized as being owned by the communists until the 1970s whole other story. But that loss of China and the real hurting of Democrats when it came to Harry Truman's like lack of response to the China issue really shapes McCarthyism because the question becomes, wait, why was the state, how, how could the State Department have let mm. this happen? How could the DOD have let this happen? It must be, cut, be because there's a communist conspiracy. So that is why Harry Truman stands tall in the face of the North Korean invasion of the South, a North and a South, a situation which perfectly replicates itself after the French withdraw from Indochina yes. in 1955, because you had North Vietnam, you had South Vietnam. There was supposed to be an actual election, an election to determine which side, which direction would go. But as these things go, let's just say it's complicated. But basically, the South knew that they wouldn't win the election in the way that they would, so they just kind of move on. It's complicated because at that point they were more democratic than the North. So this is where it starts to get complicated, complicated, complicated. Yeah. Enter 1960. Obviously. That's why I actually think this is a perfect example. There's none of this with Iraq. Saddam was there, and then we just voted. We're like, yeah, actually, we're just going to kick him out of office. There are humongous domestic political pressures. Imagine Benghazi times a thousand. And that is what China was like. Who lost China? George C. Marshall was dragged. But he was the envoy to China, the U.S. Special Envoy. He just retired. Uh, President Truman sends him over there because he's one of the most respected men in the United States. He's the U.S. Envoy to China. He presides over the quote unquote falling of China. Their Senate hearings are nationally televised. 100 million Americans are watching these things. There's big debates about who lost China, who's responsible for China. This just shaped our domestic environment dramatically. Then Korean War is like kind of a disaster. No matter what you think about it, it uh, very much Eisenhower. Let's just put it this way: was elected to end the Korean War. Okay. So and and here's the key thing: we retain the South and look yeah. at South Korea compared to North Korea today. You could say right. it was a sex. It was a, yeah. it, like it was a successful policy based on the template. Right. So okay, uh, Eisenhower then though decides not to nuke. Kennedy though comes in razor thin election, uh, 1960. People forget, you know, he ran very much as an anti-communist, as somebody who's going to confront communism, the missile gap, all of that. So he has to decide. He's like, okay, what am I going to do here 
in Indochina. And this is, again, look, I'm not a perfect historian on this, but I guess suffice it to say that South Vietnam becomes a corrupt society. Essentially, what it is is that, what is it, like the Francicized elite uh, are oppressing the uh, like the, the rural, Buddhist, the, the, yeah, the, like the so Buddhist. They were, they were, they were the the leadership. Um, Nyo Dinh Diem. Yeah, I will be checked later on my killed. Vietnamese. Yes, was it was it was a was actually a super right wing Catholic. Yeah, this all this gets complicated, <laughs> and he was repressing the the Buddhist population. That's why everyone remembers the famous picture of the Buddhist monk lighting himself on fire. Um, that was in protest over the South Vietnamese policy towards the Buddhists in the country. Yes. And so essentially what happens is then we have to decide who we're going to back in South Vietnam. There's an ongoing insurgency. Diem at one point, I believe in 1962, is assassinated. There's a lot of debate around whether we knew that assassination was coming. I believe we let it happen. I think that's the generally accepted it was six, historical well, so view. Here's the thing. It was 63 yeah. because it, was, okay. it, it happened very close to when JFK was assassinated. There and there was... It's pretty much widely historically agreed. Um, I, I've, folks who remember our JFK conversation should check out Fred Logoval's work on Vietnam. This is where most of Sagar and my stuff is, is coming from. Um, the Kennedy administration effectively knew that there was going to be a coup, and we did not stop it. So we didn't say, hey, military junta, right. kill Diem. We basically just said, eh, we're going to, what happens, like, happens. It happens, and if it did happen, Okay. Whatever. That's kind of the jump off point, because from that point forward, there's an affirmative decision to send, quote, military advisors to South Vietnam to back said uh, Vietnamese government that kills and assassinates Diem and actively battle the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese army in order to protect the integrity of South Vietnam, the quote unquote democracy. Then JFK is killed November of 1963. And that is the true jump off point for US foreign policy. London B. Johnson comes in. People forget this. Johnson was actually much more hawkish than uh, JFK was during the Cuban Missile Crisis. He advocated for starting an outright nuclear war with the Soviet Union and for quote unquote standing up to Castro. He was very much informed by the China discussion. And he used to repeatedly say, I'm not going to be the first American president to lose a goddamn war, something to that effect. Johnson secretly ramps up in combination with the Gulf of Tonkin incident and up into the 19... Okay, uh, I don't want to get my dates uh, too wrong. Let's just say this. Johnson secretly ramps up before the November 1964 election, U.S. presence in South Vietnam, deploying more U.S. military advisors. Johnson then let, uh, Jen wins one of the largest electoral victories in modern American history, has a massive mandate by the American people, both for the great, great society agenda, but similarly says to himself, I have to stand up to communism and buying fully into McGeorge Bundy and the National Security Council's theory of domino theory. Put that together, and you see then a series of affirmative decisions by the National Security Council, secretly by the Johnson administration, to deploy at one point up to half a million troops in South Vietnam. This happens and culminates, I want to say, in the 67 to 68 year where things begin to again tick up. 68 is when things reach the absolute height of U.S. debate and dissent with, of course, there's the Tet Offensive, which is... It's, I don't even know how to explain that one. It's complicated. Uh, basically, yeah. what, what happens is the, the North Vietnamese launched the Tet Offensive. It actually basically makes Lyndon Johnson not run for re-election. Yes. Ironically enough, we actually win the Tet Offensive. The Tet Offensive yeah. was a, it, when, yeah, it was a military you know, invasion. Right. They breach, they breach uh, serious periods, uh, City of places Wei, in Saigon, yeah. and they lose. Um, yeah. They actually lose. It's a military defeat. But the images are so terrible. You have the infamous Walter Cronkite, we can't win this war. Yeah, so it's the right definition of a, and this is why we end up losing in Vietnam, we consistently win the tactical Skirmishes, military battles yeah. every single time, but we lose the overall strategic picture. This also, by the way, tells you the story of the Afghanistan war. Like We are never defeated by the Taliban in the field, but in this style of warfare, wherein it's an insurgency, it's not a question of set piece battles. It's why, you know, and we'll get into this with Afghanistan, we are much better at a traditional set piece bit of warfare, aka why our intelligence about a Russian invasion is good when they're massing tanks versus when it's devastatingly bad. How long are the, Af how long is the Afghan government going to be able to stand up to the Taliban after we withdraw? Perfectly 
good explanation of why U.S. foreign policy and defense goes the way it does. Exactly. So, I mean, what we just said, that probably took like 10 minutes. And that's why Vietnam is just not the same as Iraq. It's across many administrations. Nobody ever made the conscious choice to invade Vietnam. And you can actually, if you if you really to put yourself in their shoes, you can see how they got there. Uh, I'm not saying I agree with it. I like to think I would have said differently. I don't know. I don't live in 1968 or 1965. Uh, but having read, uh, what is it, The Best and the Brightest by David Halberstam, fantastic book, I get it. I, I, I see how they got there. Uh, I think they should have made very different choices at several points. But again, you know, hindsight is 2020. Iraq, no way, completely different. I mean, the lead up to the war in Iraq, you essentially see September 13th, 2001, the Camp David meeting, Paul Wolfowitz says to President George W. Bush, he's like, we got to go after Saddam, immediately injecting Iraq into this. And then you see a concerted effort by Wolfowitz, by Cheney, and by many of these other figures in order to draw Iraq into the conversation and cast this as a global war on terror and eventually a manufactured theory of like why we need to invade Iraq, which politically is driven by ideology and capitalized on by the Bush administration and a terrified American public, which then leads to a $6 trillion war. And really, you know, the squandering of one of the, I mean, I, you know, you hate to say it, but like one of those moments when America had the most sympathy in the world, America uh, was coming off of the unipolar moment, our economy was strong, and we just squandered. I just see there's a, there's a true alternative history that I see in which because Iraq was such an affirmative choice, we could have gone in such a different direction. Personally, I think any American president has some similar pitfall in Vietnam. You know, who, no, it's who, true. Goldwater exactly would have done the same thing, right? Honestly, Goldwater might have nuked him, which is what LBJ. Uh, LBJ yeah, that was the, what that's the that's the uh, <laughs> No, and, and I think even the way that we told this story, North Vietnam, South Vietnam, South Korea, North Korea. Let's follow the same policy. It's mm -hmm. not even technically an invasion. I mean, you said invasion of Vietnam. It's backing a yeah. We never invaded Vietnam. Western well, aligned no, power. No, no. But that's a, yeah. we, we sent troops, but it's not. That's the, like that's the key thing. Like it's not an invasion uh, in terms of like that single bit. Like there was not an Iraqi government. There wasn't a South Iraq and a North mm -hmm. Iraq. So I think that's just really gets to it. So yeah, I think it's really important that people really, and this is also why there've been a couple of times where I felt like a bit of a nitpicking nerd when I've, when you've referred to, to a, a conservative hawk, like let's say John Bolton yeah. as like a neocon. So I usually like, no, 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 he wasn't a neocon. This is a neocon. And, and the reason why I want to make clear, I really focus on being very precise, but what like a neocon is versus like the pejorative way people use it on YouTube is neocon conservatism very specifically led to the war in Iraq in a way that your most let's have a $10 trillion defense budget hawkish conservatism wouldn't necessarily have given. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, that's that's right. the part that is like deeply interesting to me. And I think that if we're going to use like the term in the case of Iraq, right? Like it's obviously different. We're talking about moving forward. It's a really interesting history here. So yeah, let's, um, let's do a quick bit on just Afghanistan pull out a year later. You know, it's funny. I found myself at the start of that debate. Kabul's fallen. It's all over. Most folks, myself included, obviously fault the Biden administration when it came to the set of decisions they made that led to the, you know, horrendous pullout from a pure, like, tactical level. Um, but I was still like, you know, maybe we could have kept troops there. I've just basically come to the conclusion, you and I like disagree on Ukraine matters, but I think if we had a presence in Afghanistan still, our response in Ukraine would have been more, would have been hamstrung and a possible response in Asia with the Asia Pacific would have been hamstrung too. So I'm now at the point where I agree with you that the decision was just the right decision just to pull out, rip the bandaid. I'm not going to excuse the bad implementation, but I think it's a net positive at, at this point. What do you think? I mean, I don't, I don't think you're going to argue against that. I mean, and look, I think that a lot of histrionics, I, I've, I've had to resist doing the dunks on Twitter just because Twitter is not the correct medium for this. It takes a little bit while to explain. Here was the central critique of the Joe Biden administration. 
Donald Trump and his administration in May of 2020 sign an agreement with the Taliban government in which they agree the United States will withdraw its forces in May of 2021. Trump loses the election. So now what has happened? The Biden administration is faced with a choice. We must either honor this agreement signed by the United States government under Donald Trump negotiated by Secretary Mike Pompeo and withdraw forces in May of 2020, or we must affirmatively decide to stay. Biden decides to, quote, split the difference. He says we will not withdraw in May of 2020 because just not fast enough. The military tells him, sorry, 2021, it can't be done. We will be out by, what is it, August 31st, 2021. The Taliban say, okay, okay, we believe you. But if you stay a day past August 31st, 2021, it's weapons free on U.S. service members and on U.S. citizens who remain in the country as long as the broader West. Now, the critique of the Biden administration was we didn't do enough to plan for the exit. Well, yeah, I think that's true. That being said, I think that the military consciously did not plan for their withdrawal because they did what they did in Iraq and they did what they did everywhere. They never believed that we would actually leave. They believed that the political pressure on the Biden administration would mount to the point where they would not actually have to withdraw and they would have to stay. Biden shocked the world, frankly, by having the balls to say, no, we're actually getting the fuck out of here. And then you combine that with a military for years had been exaggerating and lying to the American public about the strength of the Afghan national security forces. And it turned out they were even more useless than their greatest pessimists would ever have believed. So it is, again, uh, let's say, what, the summer fighting season um, that the Taliban ramp up their military campaign, again, not against the U.S. military, against the Afghan government, which, by the way, this peace deal between the U.S. and the Taliban did not include the Afghan government for a reason, which is that we knew they were useless. And the Afghan government, frankly, probably was aware enough that they were going to lose in the first place, or at the very least, not be able to militarily hold their ground. So then... We actually face even more of a shit show. We both have to plan a withdrawal at the same time that major cities across Afghanistan are now failing. Everybody focuses on the fall of Kabul. I don't think people remember weeks before Mazar al-Sharif had fallen to the Taliban for the first time since 2001, which was a massive landmark moment, including in much of the battles that are happening in the north and the east part of the country, or sorry, in the west part of the country. You're seeing full-fledged Taliban victory weeks before even Kabul all happens, right? So then the central critique again of the Biden administration is, well, given these set of facts, now to both meet our deadline to make sure that we can get the hell out of here, what's the best that we can do? Now, you could say that it sounds as defense of the Biden administration. I'm more talking about within the realm of possibility, there were only a couple of options that Joe Biden has the day that Kabul falls to the Taliban. Number one, he could create a military perimeter around the entire city, and he can assume security control of Kabul. This was on the table, actually. Um, That would have required thousands of American soldiers to essentially uh, have a perimeter around the city, secure it. By the way, if you think that, you know, how many people did we lose in the fall of Kabul? 13 people? I think we would have lost hundreds of people. Not just from ISIS, there are all kinds of crazy people in Afghanistan who want to kill American soldiers. So we would have had to create a military perimeter around the city of Kabul. Everybody always focuses on giving up Bagram. I'm not going to defend that. Sure, it was a terrible idea. But again, at the time in which we have to make these very critical decisions, these are all ones which the Biden administration had to choose. Do we secure the city of Kabul and maintain responsibility, or do we allow the Taliban to do it? The political point that was made consistently was that we should have made that choice. And I just do not think that would have been worth it because, again, the critique was, oh, but this puts American citizens at risk. We've had a year now. To date, not one, not one American citizen has been killed by the Taliban in Afghanistan. Everybody says that, oh, American citizens were abandoned. Joe Biden abandoned them. It didn't happen. Actually, the Taliban secured safe passage. Every single one who's wanted to leave could leave. Interpreters, that's another story. That being said, there have not been mass executions of U.S. uh, interpreters in Afghanistan. Simply has not happened. The Taliban, look, Taliban is going to Taliban in some cases. I'm not going to sit here and say that al-Zawahiri was just sitting in the city of Kabul because the Taliban didn't know about it. He was clearly living in a Haqqani household. So This was the head of al-Qaeda who was recently killed a few weeks ago. 
All right, so he was living in Kabul. He was living in Afghanistan. But the doomsday scenario didn't happen. I mean, mass executions of U.S. interpreters did not happen. Mass executions of U.S. citizens did not happen. Mass execution of Westerners did not happen. I mean, are women going to school? No, I'm not going to sit here and tell you yes. Do I think that that's worth fighting and dying for? No, I don't. And I certainly don't think that it would have meant a way it would have justified a multi-year process. And to your point, Marshall, and I think this is important, which is that if you care about other strategic, well, let's say you care about Ukraine, even the piddly support that we're giving to Ukraine in the context of the U.S. military budget is dramatically draining Pentagon resources if we were to fight another war, even with even if we wanted to support Asia. Consider that the U.S. military was spending $300 million a day in Afghanistan. So, or sorry, a month in Afghanistan. So consider the amount of materiel, human resources, money, attention that that would have required. And also remember that if we had done what everybody had wanted, which is that we should have stayed maybe a couple months longer, the Taliban would have started shooting at us. And then we would have had to ru- uh, fight even more of a full-fledged war. So much of the critiques were all bad faith at the time. Nobody actually meant it. How many people, you know, uh, days after were like actually checking up on these quote unquote Americans abandoned in Afghanistan. These people all got out if they wanted to. It's just a total bullshit accusation. This is why I was so bothered by it at the time. Yeah, I think the only thing I'd push back on in your broad story here is just the April 2021 period. There's a way to healthily separate what is inherent to a pullout, what's inherent to the Doha deal signed with the Taliban. That means Afghan girls are not going to be able to go to school. That was that was that was written in. Um Biden, I mean, look, Joe Biden, even even in 2009, 2010, he advocated we transition yeah, our status right. in Afghanistan. He had a long-term history when it came to this issue. He was always thinking the mission in Afghanistan should be counterterrorism first, counterterrorism centric, not interested in the nation building or even, because even the term like nation building is like, you know, loaded, even the status quo management point, because like, let's get real when you push hawkish folks on what they were actually saying we should pursue in Afghanistan, it was maintenance of status quo. Yes, exactly. No one, no one seriously, I think, believed the 2000s era Afghan. And this is why this debate is so interesting. If it's 2008, I'm sympathetic about Obama's decision to surge in 2009. I likely would have supported it then. I understand why it's made. It's like, look, we t- the literal line on I this during too. the 2000 campaign was, we took our eye off the ball in Afghanistan. Things are going well there. 2002, 3, 4, 5, oh, 2006. Why does the Taliban resurge? Why is Al-Qaeda resurging? Because we went to, to Iraq. Iraq. Yeah. But, so I think people were in good faith making that argument about we really can't do things here. You're sending David Petraeus, you're doing mm-hmm. Crystal, all those things. By 2021, I don't think people basically believed that. And the basic mission was we can in perpetuity maintain just this status quo. And I think as you were laying that out when it comes to the deal being over, that's very much up for debate. And then, of course, there's your point about like the, the European theater, the Asia-Pacific theater. But I would just say the key critique is just that it was just handled de- de- devastatingly terribly. Um, there's a reason why Biden's po- Biden's poll numbers didn't start to crash after the Afghan poll out because of the fact that Afghan girls can't go to school. They started crashing after the poll out because it was very clear watching it as it went that it was a total clusterfuck yeah, it was a shit and things show. were going to the, right. but, but, and, and I think when you're talking, because I want to make clear what you were really talking about here, we just saw on Twitter, right? And I'm making that sound like it's Twitter, so it's already not relevant. There were a lot of folks on the right, especially, who'd spent a lot of their time saying, hey, you know, like, we need to get away from these forever wars. We need America first, Donald Trump, this, this, or that. Then, and this is why you sound like, you know, the best, you know, center right uh, Biden defender ever, because you're like, do you guys don't think the Trump pullout would have been a disaster? Yeah, Any pullout was always going to be a disaster under the frame that you're basically advancing here and under the frame that good faith folks who think the forever wars are bad would really accept. So seeing people just being consistent, is it, that must have been frustrating. And, I think also it comes not down punish, and also not follow up on Trump, not actually pulling out, despite multiple promises. Either. Exactly. And, and here's the thing too. It comes down to who do you, 
I understand how the U.S. government works. And I know Joe Biden didn't have nearly as much as a say as a lot of people think. And there are a lot of people in the military who are very, very happy that Afghanistan went the way that they did because they didn't want it to cover up their own foolish mistakes over the last 20 years. If you think that the Biden administration was tactically managing down to the Bagram-ish level, I don't fucking believe that for a second. These are things that are made at the Pentagon and the four-star generalship. Look, they handled the same thing in, in uh, Iraq. They did the exact same thing in 2008 when the Status of Forces Agreement. You know, Marshall, let's let's go back down this rabbit hole, right? SOFA, Status of Forces Agreement in 2008. The military never, ever planned for an actual end to the Status of Forces Agreement of 2011, which is what required Obama to pull the troops out of the Iraq and eventually was a massive mess. We ended up leaving. Everybody forgets this. We left hundreds of millions of dollars in military equipment that was eventually captured by ISIS and by the Iraqi government. Because again, the military at the time thought that Obama was full of shit and they thought that the Obama administration would never actually let us pull out of Afghanistan. We could ne- or sorry, out of Iraq and we could never actually come to a real agreement with the Maliki government. So we did it. But the military made it so that it was more of a catastrophe because they frankly did not believe civilian leadership. I think the exact same thing happened in Afghanistan. Every single one of these generals are some of, they are, first of all, they are liars. The people who were in charge of the NATO inherent resolve, or let me get my terms right. I don't want to get the wrong machine. Enduring freedom. Whatever. Enduring freedom. No. No, that was the invasion. Right, yeah, but right, whatever. Right, let's see. look it up. Yeah, see, there's been too many of these goddamn women. <laughs> Whatever. Um, so if you're in the military, four-star generals, the people, Jack Nicholson, uh, let's see, I mean, there's so many, of these commanders of our mission in Afghanistan, they lied to us at every single turn, every single year. The only person who ever told us the truth about what was going on in Afghanistan is Seagar John Sopko. I think that guy's a hero, and I think he should get the Medal of Honor. Because if you had been paying attention to What's him- What's Seagar? What's that position? A special Inspector General for Afghan Reconstruction, I believe okay. is the term. John Sopko. He was a he's an independent um, inspector general who oversaw the war. I, if you read him in 2014, you Obama would have had the same pullout. Uh, Trump would have had the same pullout. Biden would have had the same pullout. It really just uh, comes down to who you ascribe blame to, and if you really understand like how these things go, I think that the Biden administration had only marginal impact on how the actual tactical uh, withdrawal was going to go when the political decision was made that we are pulling out. And I just think a lot of people don't want to grapple with that. Look, I think this all comes down to something that's of mutual interest to us, which is just how do civilians, like we have a civilian run military. That's a feature. Yeah, right. It's well, you know, but in terms of like the president, like the president, yeah. the, like the secretary, well, I was, yeah, you, you're saying, right? Like we've had a, and this is of concern for some folks, we've had a increasing number of secretaries of defense who were former four-star um, high up generals, which is which is which is actually an issue if you think about it, because from the perspective of the way our government's constructed, once again, civilian led military. There's a reason why um, General Austin, um, Secretary of Defense, he wears a business suit when he goes. He's not in he's not in military mm-hmm. um, regalia. It's a, like it's an important philosophical principle there. I think just a huge product that folks should be really be thinking about here is like how should civilians conduct themselves moving into this next set of potential conflicts. So how should civilians be thinking about uh, the Asia-Pacific? Because this, this, this other bit here that I want to speak about for a second is there's this recurring feature, I'm sure you run into this on Breaking Point Saga, of folks who are sort of saying things like, oh, like you need to have served in the military to have opinions on these different That's topics. Yeah. And what they don't realize, they're kind of just like generically boomer cons saying that, mm-hmm. but they don't understand that that is actually a toxic mentality when you introduce it into our system, because if you introduce it, because like, we've disagreed about generals like privately, but when you, if you introduce the idea that the sole determinant of, let's say, tactical and strategic validity is having served in the military versus being in a civilian role, you are inherently setting up civilian decision makers to be rolled by their military counterparts. This also becomes increasingly dangerous in an era where you no longer have a 
draft or a wide standing expectation of military service. So once again, if you think about how is JFK able to stand up to his generals who are telling him to effectively risk nuclear war in Cuba in a totally disastrous move, he explicitly has this quote where he talks about, look, I was a lieutenant in the Navy. I know these general types. I know these admiral types. They're a bunch of jerk offs. He basically says that. Yeah, and, you know, that's true. He basically yeah. says that in twenty, you know, in nineteen sixties, in nineteen sixties language. But once again, he served. Um, we no no longer live that environment. Like Elliot Ackerman and I talked about this this idea of like should there be a draft again? I don't think that we're at the point of a society where that would make make sense at this moment. But you should just understand when there is no draft, telling civilians they are inherently below because a person's a general leads to disaster. Yeah, let's let's really tug on this, which is that. Some generals are, this is the other complicated thing. Sometimes generals are great in one context and a fucking disaster in the next. Let's take the JFK example. Who is the general who is most advocating for nuclear war with the Soviet Union? Curtis, Curtis LeMay. LeMay. Curtis LeMay. Curtis LeMay is the hero of the Pacific War. He is the one, well, I guess depending yeah. on the past, um, he firebombed Tokyo and essentially set up the process through which we ground the Japanese to the point where they would surrender after the uh, atomic bomb was dropped. Curtis LeMay is single-handedly responsible for that decision and for all of the uh, strategy surrounding crushing Japanese dissent to the point where they will actually surrender to the United States. Sorry, I did a good job. Thing real quick. Go ahead. Just because this is, I want to. We when we went hero, like basically what we're yeah. just referring to is there's a wide standing debate about. If I actually suggest that folks check out, I know Malcolm Gladwell is kind of like chuggy right now, but check out uh, what's it called? Great the book. Bomber Mafia. Yeah, Bomber Mafia. It's a very good Audible book. It's really well produced. It's from his it's studio. Only five hours too, it's yeah. it's like, exactly. It's five hours. It's a short book. It's about the decision to firebomb Tokyo, the use of strategic bombing on civilian populations. There is a big debate. To be had there, but to Sagar's point, put the morality part aside. Like Curtis LeMay is the one who said, "Quote: Oh yeah, if we'd lost the war, I would have been, I would have been put up as a war criminal." Just acknowledging that like murky nature of war, like whatever. Um, like you know, like I, I understand, and frankly, like support those decisions that were made given the context here. He did the job he was supposed to do successfully. The order yeah. defeat Japan, defeats Bingo. Japan. What happens, Sagar? When we introduce him yeah. to the Cold War. <laughs> exactly. What happens? Uh, I'll, let's say what happens. He advocate strongly we have a missile uh we have a missile and nuclear advantage over the soviet union war is coming inevitably now is the time mr president he does everything in his power to spark a war with uh with the soviet union during the cuban missile crisis this is some and again jfk has to stand up to him this former lieutenant who frankly you know some decisions there on pt 109 not so great. I mean, uh, we really want to get PT into it. PT-109 <laughs> was the only actual PT boat that right. was sawed in half That's by pretty a weird. destroyer because of poor yeah. navigation. Um, quick quick thing that really speaks, because folks like when we talk about like presidential leadership, yeah. really read about JFK and the military during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Curtis LeMay is insubordinate to a yes. degree that it's and actually- Unhinged. Like, it, it, read it, the tapes. You, you, re, you yeah. read the tapes, you listen to you, and it's sort of, it's cringeworthy yes. 50 years later. He openly, so they're at the table. It was called XCOM, like the people in government mm -hmm. who are meeting to talk about how they resolve the Cuban Missile Crisis. He openly talks about, we can't be appeasers, knowing that JFK's father, Joseph P. Kennedy, was one of the, he was ambassador to Great Britain during uh, the first part of World War II. Um, folks should check out my episode on JFK with Fred Logoval back in March, I believe. The key thing is he knows that JFK's father was an appeaser. He knows that's very, very, very difficult. But he has this moment where he's talking with JFK in front of XCOM. He lays out the situation in the most like hawkish way possible. If you don't launch airstrikes against the Cuban Missile things, everything's doomed. And then he goes, you know, Mr. President, you're in a tough spot in this very condescending, aggressive way. And then JFK goes, you're in a tough spot here with me too. Just mm -hmm. very sharply cutting him down. And once again, like that's what peak, that situation is what peak civil, civil military relations look like. JFK's job is not to design airstrikes. The critique of LBJ during the Vietnam War is LBJ is individually picking B-52 bombing targets in Laos and Cambodia. 
um, Nixon is like doing like similar, similar features. Actually, someone may need to fact check me on that. I, I know LBJ was selecting targets. He was, there's a picture of him. Yeah. yeah so th- 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 that's the definition of like, the bad relationship. But the great one is JFK being like, okay, military person, you've given me your advice. I am in charge. And you want to avoid situations where you're just overly, you're just overly deferential because our system yes. is not set up for that. There's, an, there's another great example. I'll give you the secondary and then obviously the most famous. General Maxwell Taylor, hero of World War II, 101st Airborne Division, the Screaming Eagles, kicks the Nazis in the teeth, uh, famously at the Battle of Normandy, all of this. He misses the Battle of Bastogne. I forget exactly why, but whatever. Hero general of World War II. Who do you think is the general who was advising as chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and later the uh, ambassador to South Vietnam for ramping up troop presence there and hammered to JFK and to President uh, LBJ in order to increase and to fight harder against the North Vietnamese? Boom. Once again, hero general of World War II, terrible political leader and decision maker whenever it comes to Vietnam. And then the most famous MacArthur. MacArthur, the famous admiral, the guy, you know, I shall return, Philippines. Uh, rebuilds famously, Japan. Yeah, rebuilds Japan. He's a hero in Japan, in Asia. Hadn't come back to the United States since 1937. He served so long abroad. He was essentially a king um, all the way Emperor, out there. Emperor, some would say. Yeah. I saw, well, yeah, I think that's what they called him. Emperor Mac or whatever. Massive egomaniac, interesting guy in his own right. Well, what happens is we uh, eventually get into the Korean War, and General MacArthur openly is insubordinate uh, to President Truman and takes essentially wants to advocate for nuclear war with China <laughs> um, and through a series of maneuvers. Now, he claims that these tactical maneuvers, which would have risked, again, nuclear confrontation with China and the Soviet Union, would have won us the Korean War definitively. But again, he doesn't have to deal with the fact that he would not be the one who has to make the decision and diplomatically deal with the fact that China and the Soviet Union would then get into war. And so Truman fires MacArthur. That decision is probably one of the single most important decisions in American history because it again solidifies that the American commander-in-chief, that Harry S. Truman, who at the height of his military experience, I want to say – at his best, he's, he's a he's, lieutenant colonel in World War One. Not even artillery that, dude. officer, dude. Yeah. It's even worse. He's a not even worse, right? Because yeah. any service is admirable, right. obviously, in that context. He's a cap. He's a field artillery captain, captain okay. yeah. in the Missouri right. National Guard. Bingo. In World War One, he's over there for like six months. All right, fine. Guess what? It was actually good. Good, right? But the point is, is that career politician Harry S. Truman, senator, vice president. President of the United States fires Douglas MacArthur for being openly insubordinate and for not subordinating subordinating his military tactics to the overall political strategic goal of the U.S. Because there was diplomatic considerations that trumped whatever the so-called tactical move that MacArthur wanted to make. And I know there's a bunch of military history geeks that are annoyed with me. Again, I can't be an expert on everything. But I still believe that to be one of the most important decisions ever made. And in my estimation, one of the greatest mistakes of the uh, world, the global war on terror, the GWAT era, is that the Bush administration and even the Obama administration were far too deferential to the United States military, that we should have had much, much better strategic consideration, and that in Iraq especially, W's decision not to get involved at the strategic level and to basically pass everything off onto the military and the State Department is one of the great failures of the modern American state. And so I advocate, and I know a lot of military people will get pissed at me for this, but I'm sorry. I mean, you guys serve at the pleasure of the president and the commander in chief is the duly elected president for a reason. It doesn't always work out great, uh, but it's a system that I have a ton of belief in. And I think that there are very often major mistakes and mindsets that the military has in which they view things just like MacArthur, like, oh, if we could have just, I hear this all the time in Afghanistan, if we could have just taken the gloves off against the Taliban. What the fuck does taking the gloves off in 2008 have to do with the eventual outcome in 2021? Nothing. I'm sorry. There's an entire generation of fighters. Killing, yeah, exactly. killing, the killing, question. killing an additional 10,000 right. Taliban Nothing. fighters doesn't, doesn't right. change the underlying reality. It As doesn't we all actually, learned in Vietnam. It doesn't, actually, it doesn't actually build a sustainable Afghan nation state. And the Bingo. quick thing here, because I want to hit a quick energy crisis thing to finish out the episode. The, the quick thing here is we're doing, we've done a lot of coverage of naval policy 
those different bits. And we always, we get criticism for folks who are like, oh, like this is like really warmongery and whatever. The reason why we're covering the Navy is that, look, we're all civilians here. Like most of the listeners are civilians. And given our form of government, you as a civilian, especially given the debates we're about to have about Taiwan, China, and the Asia Pacific, no, you actually should understand that there are some yes, huge yes. debates about how the Marine Corps is going to transform to confront that challenge. There actually is a huge debate about whether we should be focusing on like carriers or whether we should be transitioning the Navy into some other bit. There's going to be a huge debate this decade about whether we need to have a 300, 400 ship Navy again. Those debates have to be accessible to civilians because if they're not, we end up in a path of just like very, very, very consistent. They don't want effective policy, Marshall. They don't want the Pentagon wants nothing less than our input. And I can already because here's the thing: I went to school with these guys. Half of a quarter of my class at Georgetown in my national security program were military, and there's nothing they hated more. And when I would open my mouth about strategic questions about Iraq, and I would always get the classic like, "We defeated the Iraqi Republican Guard," and I would always, I mean. Maybe provocative, but like, who gives a shit? I'm like, okay, you beat the Iraqi guard in three weeks. The Iraq war was a disaster and was lost. Is that a military question or is that a strategic question? And that is something which I watch these guys completely unable to grapple with. At some point, this is also gets to the civilian question, which is they were too connected to it. You know, they had fought. I mean, listen, I get it. If you saw somebody who died in Baghdad, like it's hard to admit that uh they died in a campaign which strategically was a disaster for the U.S., but that's the job of the civilian advisor and of the president in order specifically in order to make those types of decisions. And that's why we should never, never defer to the military on strategic questions. Their job is to accomplish tactically what we lay out to our strategic goals. And the, I mean, there's a lot of, uh, anyway, this goes back all the way, all the way back to American history. Abraham Lincoln, Civil War, and so much more. But civil, like the the best strategists in general are the civilians, and it's the military leaders. The great ones are the ones who can tactically accomplish your strategic goal. Well, it's interesting. Well, I mean, you could say so. For example, I'd say excellent strategist would be George C. Marshall. So yeah, George, so so, so 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 it's not it's it's not that there's. Let me put it this way. Typical, and this is this is the real secret, Sagar. When you say the greatest strategists tend to be civilians, what we're really just saying is those civilians tend to hold by tradition the roles that make those decisions. George C. Marshall is unique in that he's actually he's a planner general. Um, He doesn't lead U.S. forces in Europe. He's in he's in he's in D.C. And he eventually becomes Secretary of State. So he obviously, by definition, is able to combine those two roles effectively. Look, the, 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 the real answer here is that it just folks on all sides of these debates need to be really engaged because when we offer a quick uh, defense of a general who gave useful input to civilians, useful input to civilians, he was totally backhanded. General Eric Shinseki. Shinseki. Mm-hmm. This is during yeah. 2002, 2003. He is a army general who testifies before Congress that we were that the occupation of Iraq was going to require a larger number of troops than civilian Donald Rumsfeld wanted, because remember, and this also shows, we're not going to get to energy. We'll save that for next week. But this also just shows how there's so much nuance here. So for again, once again, why I don't like when people call someone like Donald Rumsfeld, RIP, a neocon, warmonger, captured by the defense industrial complex. His whole thing was defense transformation. His whole thing is, I was in, I was, I was a fighter pilot. I worked in corporate America. I was the youngest Secretary of Defense. Soccer, many of his critiques of jet of many of the critiques you just gave of generals. Oh, I know. If yeah, you yeah. talk to Donald Rumsfeld in 2001, you'd say, Sagar, you're my yeah. new press secretary. <laughs> I agree with you. Before um, it's, it's actually kind of funny. Before it's not funny because it's September 11th, but before September 11th, people predicted that Don Rumsfeld was gonna be one of the first members of the Bush administration to be let go slash fired because he was just consistently clashing. With the generals in the Department of Defense, he cancels the Patriot missile. You know, not the Patriot. There is the Paladin uh, missile battery, artillery battery that could shoot artillery shells hundreds of miles. It was the definition of a Cold War boondog. It didn't make any more sense. So he's cutting into the budget. He's cutting the defense industry. He's saying these guys want this giant Cold War, massive army that has all of their toys. When instead we could have a smaller nimbler, quicker, 
effective army built around principles from the 1990s, basically what was referred to as the Revolution in Military Affairs, RMA. Look it up. There's a lot of, there's actually a really good book on this by one of our favorite authors, Fred Kaplan. Yeah. What then happens though, is the war, the, you have the lead up to the war in Iraq. Don Rumsfeld, he's a very like wily political operator. He never really specified during the lead up to the war whether he was pro a war or against the war. He was basically going to go for whatever W, he was going to politically support whatever W supported. So once W says we're going to war, he merges his nimble, cheaper military into the Iraq plan. So when General Shinseki, and this is why, Soggy, you're talking about tactics mm. and, and that level, military level, General Shinseki says, look, Here's the size of the uh, here's the size of Iraq. Here's the nature of the country. It's going to take X hundreds of thousands of troops, and they're going to have to be there for a sustained period of time. That was the last thing budget cutting Don Rumsfeld wanted to hear. So effectively, Eric Shinseki is completely just sort of like slapped down. This is pushed to the side, and then you see the first three years of the Iraq War be a total disaster because we literally did not have enough troops to sustain a presence in the country. This is what actually leads to the surge. Like this is why Don Rumsfeld is let go after the 2006 election. So it's just the perfect story of how you have to balance these things. Just because someone wants to cut the budget doesn't mean they're going to be a good decision maker. Just because someone's a general doesn't mean they're wrong. It's such a it's it's such a mix, and that's why you actually have to have, and why I think your grad program was important, Sagar. You actually have to have this like hundred year history, kind of at beck and call, so you can't get caught in these traps. Yeah, I mean, look, the downside of what I'm saying is that yeah, sometimes the general's right and the civilian is wrong. But guess what? We have elections in order to deal with that. And by 2006, within several years, the American people make it known that the Iraq war is a disaster and we need to change course. I'll, I'll take that system any day of the week. Um, and also, look, Shinseki, he was a rare breed um, in terms of our four-star general corps. I just, I don't have any confidence in our current four-star general corps. And uh, I think people like him were a product of a very specific moment in time that the current makeup of the U.S. military is probably more ideological than it has ever been at the very, very top brass in terms of their view of the world. And I will take the civilian correction once again, any day of the week. So anyway, that's what I think. Well, it's kind of interesting. I'll wrap with this. The real issue that you have during the Iraq war and the Afghan like war, the long-term part of it, is you have the mix of political and military. And those are the situations where the military is just least suited by tradition, by structure, by like nature of the of these conflicts. And the key thing with the Shinseki thing is that was a pure, I mean, obviously everything's political, like the number of troops that you need to sustain an occupation yeah. is a political question. But at a core level, that is still something that the military by definition- It's qualified to do. It's qualified right. to do. Like General right. Shinseki is the definition of someone who could say, you say, okay, civilians, you're telling me to like take this country. Okay, how many troops will we require to do that job. And it's the lack of deference to him on that question that leads to the bad history. Mm -hmm. The right. question of, okay, so let's say we did want to defeat the Chinese fleet in the Taiwan Strait. If we did at a civilian level decide to fight that war, that is a question that the military is equipped to handle. The question of, and this goes to your point about the Cuban Missile Crisis, the question of, should we fight the Chinese? What should the U.S political relationships towards China be, that is a civilian decision. So being able to place these in buckets is, is just so key. So, hey guys, this uh, episode went way longer in this topic than I thought it would, but look, this is now just turning into the 9-11 anniversary um, episode um, in terms of the way we actually frame this Good. one. We're, we're talking yeah. about energy next week. Um, I always just think about this, like a huge percent of, percentage of our listenership was born after 2001. Uh, and that, and just, it's, it's, we were just about as young as you could be and still remember all of a sudden, like we were, we were in third and fourth grade as this is no fourth and fifth grade I was as this, grade, as this yeah. is revving up. Like I remember I was like going to the gym with my mom when I saw like the, the bombs start landing on Baghdad on CNN mm -hmm. back during those classic days. So something that folks should look into, I'm going to put out the sub stack today. I'm going to have a bunch of links to the different books and concepts we mentioned, all this great stuff. Once again, to finish this up, if you've listened to this far, you really enjoy the show and we appreciate your support. Realignment.supercast.com. We will see you all next week. Subscribe now.